Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack It Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Three stakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito This is the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Sharon and Eric Lopez. Welcome in. It's Jeff. It's Eric. We got Kyle and Bryson here on this, uh, well, we're about to hit November, guys. We're a little bit late on this show. We're recording this Thursday night, October 27th. Uh, Welcome in. Uh, And we, for the second time this year, we are coming off of a UCF loss uh, against ECU, but that precedes the game that we're previewing, which is the biggest game of the Schedule so far against uh, Cincinnati uh, <clears throat> coming up. The top 25 team coming into town, so we'll be previewing that. A little bit later, we're going to talk about Brett Yormark, the commissioner of the Big 12, coming to campus and some of the TV news that Eric has been talking about. Also, uh, a quick wrap of basketball media day that came in. And uh, we'll also talk about women's soccer, who uh, finished their regular season Actually, tonight Bryson's going to talk about that and now, uh, some a, other things. That's a championship. Now, we team. got a lot of we got a lot to talk about here. So uh, make sure you follow us, blackandgoldbanneret.com, UCF Banneret underscore SBN on Twitter, also Black and Gold Banneret on Facebook, Instagram, and of course our YouTube channel as well. Which takes us to our uh, let's get started with our preview of. Saturday's game, 3.30. Let's dive right in, guys. It is UCF against Cincinnati. The Knights coming off of that 34-13 loss at ECU. You know something? I got to give you, Kyle Nash, a ton of credit here. Wow. Because you told me <laughs> right off the, right off the bat, while the game was going down, as it was, like, nobody was saying that this was a trap game, and look what's happened. Oh, uh, well, there was one guy. I can't. Well, we don't, we're on a podcast, so I don't need to worry about getting my Admiral Akbar figure off the stand there. It's a trap. You know, this is what a trap game actually looks like. But to be honest, gentlemen, I don't really think the 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 mental physics associated with a trap game was actually the issue. Listen, I don't care how bamboozled your brain is or how messed up your mind is. If you can't, if you start the game with that many turnovers, taking up that much of your time. With the ball on offense, you're in a lot bigger trouble than anything in your mental state. And as much yeah. as I know the popular thing is to go with, well, they got overconfident with that their 70 burger. No, I don't think that's what happened here. And you know why I'm not sure that's what happened here? How much of the offense did we actually get to see Saturday night? You know, listen, there's a, not a lot. ECU controlled the ball. Exactly. In brilliant fashion. And and really the only I feel like the only reason why the, the clock evened up as much as it did is because UCF had to go straight passing to try to get the ball going, which always kind of ticks more time off the clock when there's a completion here or there. But with the it, it, I'll put it this way. And granted, the defense kind of not getting off the field helped, too. I know, you know, Drew harped on that quite a bit on the knee jerk reaction there on the black and gold banner dot com. Of course, he's completely forgetting about the fact that it was still within two scores. You know, after three Are straight you critiquing turnovers. the knee jerk reaction. No, I'm just giving the other standpoint of blaming it all the, on the defense. Well, it's a horrible take. Well, I, is is it though? Because let me because let me let me put put this out there. Um, even despite the turnovers, the three turnovers on the first half. Which, by the way, if they score on that first possession, by the way, I think it's a whole totally different complexion of the game. But whatever, you know, butterfly flaps its wings and wherever. Mm-hmm. Um, Coming out of the break, coming out of halftime, UCF did exactly what they needed to do. They got three before the half, got mm-hmm. the kickoff, scored seven right away. So it was 17-10 basically at the start of the second half. When Cincinnati got the ball for the first time in the third quarter. And then what do they do? 
Nine plays, I think it was 60 or 70 yards, five minutes off the clock, bang, seven right back, and you're back down 14. So let me get all you have to do is make all you have to do is make one stop and you have the ball in a one score game. So let me so, get this, let me get this straight, Jeff. Let, let's put this in perspective what you just did, and I mean it respectfully. Okay. Forget about the fact they're going into this game somewhat inflated as one of the top, if not the top, red zone defense in the nation. Forget, mm-hmm. forget about the fact that they that they held them down for the first half. We're gonna just forget those first 15 minutes and you gave up a touchdown. Bro, come on now. Well, like, let's 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 take a look here. You you gave up 147 net rushing yards. Uh, you gave up 300. By the way, you get uh, Holt Nailers. Eric, I'm still waiting for him to throw that interception you told me he was going to throw. Well, I, didn't know, uh, I didn't know he was, was going to just. He was the entire 30. Game. He was 30 for 36. Yeah, he's saving the pick for Provo. 30 uh, for 36. <laughs> You make fun of Holton Ehlers needing AARP, but what, but what are they 30 for 36. And against the UCF defense they used by blitzing every, basically blitzing him, any quarterback could have gone 30 for 36. Gentlemen, you're citing the wrong thing here. In- yeah, that's the wrong point. The point is the offense is terrible. Turnovers. Well, can't throw the uh, turnovers. You're not going to. Hold up a second. Hold up a second. How is, how is the country's number six ranked offense terrible? What have they done it against real teams? This is ain't South Carolina State. This ain't like FAU. This ain't Temple. See, that's the problem. These numbers are exaggerated. What have they done when they have faced adversity? Nothing. They have struggled. They have struggled to throw the ball. John Rice Plumley hoiled onto the ball too long, which helped the defensive line put pressure because we're going to talk about the offensive line, Kyle, but part of the problem as an offensive lineman is when the quarterback decides to hold the ball instead of throwing the ball away. And that happens a lot too in this offense. One thing, we haven't get rid of it. one thing we haven't mentioned that we absolutely have to hear, gentlemen, if we're going to yeah. do a proper analysis, the reason why Holden Ehlers was 30 for 36 was partially him. I'm not here to say he did nothing. But those <laughs> receivers wearing purple on that field, one-on-one so coverage, many one-on-one, one-on-one right? that did CJ not happen Johnson, in any yeah. other game, Correct. and to not give that group credit here, listen, I'm not here to say that the defense was great. I don't think they were necessarily bad. We're just not giving ECU the credit they deserve. The game plan was to attack Holton Ehlers into making a mistake because T. Will listens to this podcast and Elo promised an interception. <laughs> but the problem is he couldn't get there. But Kyle, they couldn't get there. That was the problem. No, oh, but there were plenty of hurries, though, Elo. Sure, they didn't get home on everything. Here, well, here, no, here's the thing: there were plenty of hurries. But to Ehlers' credit, and I and 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 I gotta I gotta shout out my new favorite Twitter account uh, on UCF UCF X's and O's UCF XOS on Twitter. They broke down the fact that what Ehlers did was he had on every play he had a check with me. Mm-hmm. And if UCF blitzed, that ball was coming out quick to one guy in one on one space. And, and he nailed of- every single one of them. And the way you know that is, and the way we know that that worked was he completed 30 passes for 311 yards. That's 10 yards of completion, which fact- is not a lot, right, Kyle? Yeah. Right. No, and you make a great point, but the punch like I also make is normally those one and one, one-on-ones go to the defense here. The defensive backfield being the most experienced in of this group, and there are a bunch of guys that are incredibly talented. I don't have to tell you about Devon Wilson if you've been following things. I don't have to tell you about Newt. Uh, he's hashtag talent. I get it. But not this time. These receivers well, are we're, sized we're, in a way that credit. I haven't seen lately. Did the staff do the defensive backs a disservice by blitzing as much as they did and leaving them on an island against talented receivers, Kyle? I thought they that's were the correct answer. And I don't think they adjusted in that game. And that's where Drew was 100% in the KJR. The scheme sure. was certainly... And any quarterback, especially a quarterback that's played college football for 30 years like Holton Ehlers, can figure that out. Well, you say that now, sir. Well, Again, listen not to any the quarterback. Podcast. Yeah, I, I, I would not have expected... Tanner Mordecai didn't necessarily do it. Oh, wait, he didn't, you know. So it, it, I'll put it this way. It, it, in fairness, I can see why T. Will and company dialed up the game plan they did because, you know, against other lines and other good quarterbacks, it worked. And, yes, I'm counting Tanner Mordecai as a good no, quarterback. That's, fair. that's a fair point. You bringing me back to my point from, yeah, you already know where I'm going, Elo. Yeah, You're not, yeah. you've heard this speech already. Yeah. In the on the night shift, I cited it's not the seventy burger that can be what got this group overconfident. It's the win against SMU. 
T. Yeah. Will got a little too bit too confident in all the one on ones his DBs won in the end zone. By the way, right? Four passes Absolutely. defended yeah. in the end zone and an interception as well. He was thinking his guys could win the one on one, and he wanted to get aggressive and control it up front. And if I say to you, control rookie Barber in the middle, <laughs> well, what happened was so you know it, it's easy to say now that we saw these receivers make the plays that they did. Because no offense to Ailers, again had a good game. But yo, he got made to look good plenty of times. Well, Johnson is well, going to be in the NFL. Well, here, here's here, here's the other thing too, and I thought great job by ECU and Eric. We talked about that coaching staff at ECU, how they were Mike turning Houston, things absolutely. around. Mike Houston's a very good coach because not only I thought Kyle did they scheme well on offense to beat UCF's defense, they schemed well on defense. And the way I and and I know it's like you know okay, you know limited data point, but we know how. I, we, one of the reasons why I think that was because some of the turnovers that they were forcing, remember uh, uh, JRP was hitting that quick slant against SMU. Right. right. They adjusted it, that quick slant. He was able to hit Kobe Hudson a couple of times. I think Javon Baker had a couple. What was JRP's first pick? Exactly. No, it was on is- that quick slant where they hid the backer. Mm-hmm. And th- they looked at that SMU film. They were extraordinarily – well prepared, and, and I think you, I, I think you gotta you gotta well, hand it to they're, ECU they're, because they 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 took advantage of what they UCF thought they could do well, and they took it away and they made plays. I, that's you well. Know, look, they, there's a there's a reason wow, why just a, Chris, just a well a great job by the coaching staff. There's mm-hmm. a reason why Chris Vanini and others have try to put ECU as a sleeper the last couple of years. Mike Houston's putting a good roster there. I think the frustration that Pirate fans have had is Holton Ayler's inconsistency. To his credit, he didn't fall for the bait on Saturday and force the issue. He gave, he saw the defense, threw the ball, jump, let his players win the game for him. He didn't try to win it himself. That's a credit to him. That being said, that's still a terrible loss for UCF because it's put them now. Their backs are against the wall. Their season's well, on the line this Saturday. Well, here's the thing. You can – oh, go ahead, Kyle. I'm sorry. Backs are against the wall exactly how. Now, maybe if you're talking about NY6 and all that other stuff, yes, essentially, yes. sure. Absolutely. But at, at the moment, and as much – I'm not – I they're still kind of in the driver's seat if they come out of Saturday with a yes. win. Now, yeah, that's still a thing. So we, we're talking about backs against the wall. Eh, to be honest, I'm not there yet if I'm a UCF fan. But no, Perfect but yeah, segue. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go, no, Eric, what were you going to say? I, I think that's why, as you'll get into, one of the things that's a concern is I don't think this team, you've got a rough stretch coming here. This team can't, pro- they haven't proven they can win on the road. Oh, oh, this, 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 the rough stretch has already started. Cause like I, like I had pointed out coming into last week, five of their last six games are against coming into last week, the other, the other top five, uh, the, the other top teams in the top six in the American. Mm hmm. They're playing the top of the conference right now. The only team that's not is USF. So as we segue perfectly to the Cincinnati Bearcats, who right now are ranked, are atop the American Conference at a record of 6-1, and 3-0 and in the league. Their only loss was in their opener at Arkansas by seven points. Uh, they've scored 28, 28 or more in every – really the only game where they, that they really uh, – although they've had two close wins in their last two games, they won at home against South Florida by only four – and they held off SMU in Dallas last week. Uh, so Luke Fickle's team, not as dominant as last year. Still very, very good. Uh, and de- and defensively, it shows. They're 17th in the country in total defense, 29th in rushing, 18th in pass yards allowed. Uh, offense is not quite what it was, 45th in total offense. But UCF comes into this game at the bounce house, a one-and-a-half-point favorite. Uh, 52% of the money is on Cincy plus the 1.5, according to Odd Shark. Over under 56. Uh, UCF has not beaten Cincinnati since 2018, since the College Game Day game, which throws us back to another thing that Eric is only just recently recovering from. I don't think fully. There was a chance for UCF to host College Game Day. It was theirs. And it was uh, of course, yeah. Well, you've done the re- you've you know who to talk to. You said it was there, and it ha- all they had to do is beat East Carolina, and they would have had college game day for UCF and Cincinnati. Instead, they're going to Jackson State because Ugh. Deion Sanders. Um, that's really the only reason. Uh, the, uh, 
you know, but either way, this is a 3.30 game on national TV. And as Kyle was saying, college game to your side, you are still not in the driver's seat, but you still control your own destiny because UCF can, if UCF can beat Cincinnati and beat Tulane, those are the two teams that are still ahead of them in the conference standings. Uh, granted, they have some other games that they got to play too. But at Memphis, for starters, at Memphis, not going to be easy. That's a good Memphis team. Y'all, y'all going to leave Bryson behind on his bingo card and not mention Tulane here? The hell, guys. <laughs> No, I mentioned Tulane. Like Jeff mentioned Tulane. Jeff mentioned Tulane. <laughs> no, I mentioned Tulane. And that game's, in, that game's in New Orleans. I just wanted to mention Bryson by bringing you guys down. That was the goal. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. To be completely honest, I almost did pick – because I knew that either ECU or Tulane was probably going to be the trap game this, this year. And Except I went with – It's not a trap Tulane. game now. It's not a trap game anymore. It would well, have been. Well, here, here's here's yeah. hoping you were right about ECU being the trap game and not Tulane because Tulane right now is having a hell of a year. Yeah, They're seven right. and one and four and zero oh in the conference, uh, and they still they still have uh, UCF, SMU, and Cincinnati on the slate. They play Tulsa uh, at noon on the fifth. They actually have a week off. And you want to uh, say Tulane Gauntlet? Does. Gracious. Yeah, yeah. At Tulsa, UCF, SMU, at Cincinnati, finish out the year. All right. Well, we're going to find out what that team's made up. But anyway, back to Cincinnati, Eric. Is this the traditional Luke Fickle team that we've come become used to seeing the last three years that they've beaten UCF, 19, 20, and 21? Uh, or can they be had in Orlando? Oh, they can be had. They're a young team. They lost a, I mean, nine guys, went to the NFL. This team is much more uh, not as disciplined. I think they've had uh, eight penalties or more in every game or just about. They've had more games this year where they've had eight penalties or more than all of last year. They're actually dead last in yeah. America in penalty yards per game. They, have, they give the yeah. most penalty yards per game. Take so, note uh, there, Jeff. Yeah. You said America, not the American, for clarity. In right, America, right. in the country, FBS, yes. I think, right, and you tend to see that with, you know, especially their defensive style, their aggressive defense. When you have so many new starters, you know, new guys getting a lot of playing time, you're going to make mistakes. Uh, you know, they're not as good of a passing team with Desmond Ritter, but – but they are still aggressive. They can still get to the quarterback. I still think they have the best offensive line and defensive line in this conference, which is going to be a challenge for this line, Kyle, that we've discussed, which is the frightening thing. If East Carolina was able to manhandle the UCF line, what is guys like Pace, who, to me, Pace is the best player on the field on Saturday. That guy was born to be a New York Giant, Jeff. If you can get your hands on this guy. Ivan that Pace, guy, yeah, that guy can play. He is a stud. And UCF's going to have uh, to deal with him and try to protect John Rice Plumley into running him. This is going to be a physical football game. That's the one thing that uh, Luke Fickle, they are very similar. They're still going to be physical. They're still going to try to beat you up, but they're a little more not as disciplined, which could favor UCF here if Cincinnati gives them a couple cheapies penalties here. So, so Kyle, let me let me segue that by asking you this. You're Gus Malzahn, uh, Chip Lindsey, and Travis Williams here. You're, you're, you go into the Fortress of Solitude after that ECU loss where you had some things exposed. Uh, and now you have your biggest challenge of the year. What's got? What do you got to work on this week? Well, what do you work on exactly? It's all fundamental stuff that got broken. I asked this question of Gus. I says to him, uh, or I asked him, you know, hey, you, it's all mistakes. All these wounds are self inflicted. How do you coach that? Right? It's not exactly like, well, if there's a strategy here, and or if you just do this a little differently. Like, you can't go back to the practice field, and to put it bluntly, I don't like to use this term typically on shows like this, but you can't just go out there and coach and say, okay, guys, don't suck. Like, that's not an option, okay? So, you know, I, I, as much as, you know, Drew and Elo wanted to blame it's, Jim Moore. It's too bad, bad the, Joe Madden's, the, the Joe Madden, you know, equation doesn't – try not to suck this week, guys. Yeah, there you go, right. You can't come out, what the hell is going on here? Not a coaching method. Yeah. And by the way, where are Drew and Eric after getting on Traymon Morris's brash case for not protecting the football? I haven't heard that once on this pod yet. Drew's not here in his defense. I get it. But, but the punchline is this. The, the part, wh- what you do is you find ways. Where you, where you, what you really have to do is take pace out of the game somehow by getting the ball away from him, which means trying to find receivers in space, which means Plumlee has to complete a pl- pass, which means somebody's got to get separation or you got to scheme guys open. 
So there, there's, there's going to be an attempt at pencil whipping here, one coach to another. Luke Fickle, however, is not a very easy guy to try to, to, to pencil whip with planning and trying to scheme guys open, that sort of stuff. You, you asked Eric earlier um, a question I had an answer to. Is this the Luke Fickle team that we've of, of the past? Only in the ways that it matters in the trenches. One of the top teams in sacks, and you got these guys. Uh, listen, uh, respect to Grable and what he's done coming along and his work trying to gel with the rest of this line, but you cannot let another human being cross your face like that and be credible as a tackle. Not in my craft, sir. Uh, one other thing, I, you know, I, somebody brought this up. I forget it was, but uh, I, I was looking at one other stat having to do with the defense, and not to get on them too much, but they're still number, you know, they're still number one in the country in red zone defense allowed at fifty seven percent, which is still amazing to me. Um, <laughs> but you know where they really have struggled this year? There's one particular one particular stat which is just shocking to me when I actually looked at it. UCF, out of 129 teams ranked in this category, UCF is 115th in the country in turnovers forced. They've only forced seven turnovers this year. This is a team that finished in the upper quarter of FBS last year. In that sense, they've only forced seven turnovers this year. Can I guess? Now you could say you could say fumble luck and things like that. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna insert yeah insert my inner Brian Murphy because I feel like you two have had this argument in past years when Murph would be on the pod. So I'm gonna pretend I have a Stetson hat on right now and and you could always try and and go. Well, well, wait. I'll do my Murph impression. Jeffrey, Jeffrey. Well, (laughs) well, hold on. Let me. Let me. It's luck. Okay. In some ways, Sorry, Murph. What, Sorry, what, what do we say? Luck, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Uh, passes intercepted. UCF has only intercepted two passes this year. Yeah. Just two. 120th well, in the country. What well, we don't know is how many of those have been dropped. I mean, there's a lot of Fair. luck and fortune. They've also recovered only five fumbles. It's 41st in the country. So they're forcing, fu- they're forcing some fumbles at a right. modest rate. But... I would like to see I, – actually, I would like to see that advanced stat. I don't know if anybody's got it. If they do, send it to us. Uh, you see a better under square SPN. Uh, dropped interceptions. The sport, as we know, Kyle, could be a little fickle, shall we say. Huh? I see what you did there. Uh, uh, I'm going to end this podcast podcast right now if you guys well, keep this up here's uh, what it is i'm gonna have to end some of some of the misconception here though it's not it's not luck here it's the scheme in my opinion t will is bringing out a, a strategy which i don't necessarily disagree with but it's a bend don't break let's play to prevent the big play and keep everything in front of us but if you're not playing aggressive you don't get turnovers what is it opportunity meets success is your luck well, you're not creating opportunities, ergo, you're not creating the success. This is a scheme problem, not a player problem. Bryson, you say uh, you, you had a point too? Yes. I want to, because I know you guys talked about how Holton Naylor's and the receivers had success, but let's not forget that Keaton Mitchell ran, ECU's running back ran all over the UCFB defense, getting the 100, 105 yards and two TDs. Since he has another running that has, since he has a running back of its own that's a little bit like him in Charles McClellan, who is fifth in the nation in rush yards per carry and is, and is second in rushing yards in the conference, 35th in the nation, right behind Mitchell. A great story, by the way. He's had both his knees replaced, uh, but he has stuck replaced? it out. Like pro- yes, yes. He's had procedures done on his, both his knees, and, re- and re- he's really good story. Whoa. He's still playing football. Yeah, great story. He stuck it out. With How's he program. still running? That's my question. He's, <laughs> he's had work done on his knees. That's a lot of work. Uh, I mean, props, but one quick thing to Bryson's point. I don't want to go that completely unscathed. Listen, it's amazing what you can, an opening you cre- can create for a running back, Bryson, when your quarterback is averaging 300 in the air. You're not seeing that from Cincy, I can guarantee. No, you're right about that. And that's going to be interesting about this game because I think both teams pl- have to play from a, from a head because you have two quarterbacks that you don't know if they can lead a comeback. We don't know that with well, JRP. Well, we don't know that about Bryant for Cincinnati either. Great. Well, that, I, I guess that's I guess that's what which team is better at playing from ahead? Which team is built to play I, from ahead? I think they're both built, to be honest, to play from ahead. That's that's the clash here. Both teams are going to try to run the ball here. Try who has the most success? Turnovers will play a factor. Field position plays a factor, as always it does. You mentioned Luke Fickle. He always has a wrinkle that 
doesn't pop up on the video and th that he'll save for a game like this. What is that wrinkle? You know, in past years against Dylan Gabriel, Drew made it, I would argue, made his name on this, pointed out that Luke Fickle brought up that defense that really confused Dylan Gabriel and Josh Heupel that they probably still lose sleep over. Mm. Uh, what is that wrinkle? Is that 3 3 5 thing? Yeah. So, what is that wrinkle against JRP, who is a mobile run quarterback? And I think a big key stat here to watch tackles for losses cincinnati feeds off tackles for losses both teams cannot afford to be in second and third and longs because these defenses could feed off of that if they are in long distance that's where you also could create pressure and create turnovers if you have second and third and long from a defensive standpoint yeah all right well let's uh, again i wanted to go through the uh by the way odd shark is predicting the score 30 38.7 29.1 in favor of cincinnati Despite the minus one point five in favor game. of UCF, this is the rivalry. This yeah, I think this is going to be this is going to be tight. Yeah, if that's what they're rivalry. predicting, bet the under. Good God. <laughs> well, the over under is fifty six. So, I mean, they're predicting. Remember, Kyle, if it goes to overtime, it could go. You know, then no, the that's a great point. Yeah, that's the problem. Uh -huh. You know, it's that gimmick nonsense. You know. But statistically, I feel like overtime is tantamount to the green squares on the roulette wheel, so I'm not super wow. worried about that. But, um, for, yeah, it, it's interesting that you mentioned the, the the predicted scores there, and yet the under is under the combination of both of those. So yeah, I, I think they're accounting for one-dimensional offenses on both sides, as they should. But at the end of the day, I think – UCF is more of the powder keg than Cincinnati is and that all you need is to get one guy the right amount of space and see you by this just in Ryan O'Keefe excellent athlete yeah by the way a little uh little extra juice on this one all-time series you guys know what it is it's five five isn't it no but it's four to three Cincinnati mm -hmm. and they have won the last three yep no, and this is, again, so. this is the rivalry. This is UCF's rival. Whether people want to admit it or make excuses, well, it's not geography and the media, you know, the media likes the geography. This is the rivalry. This is the benchmark. Cincinnati's been the benchmark program the last few years, whether you, you know, we want to admit it or not, they have. And you, Cincinnati had to learn the ropes from UCF. If you look at it, these two programs have dominated the Americans since 2017. And I do, and this is where I disagree with you, Kyle. I think this is a must win for UCF because... For many reasons. I must win. Win or your season's pretty much done. Because you're not... If you don't beat Cincinnati at home... on home Wait coming, a second. Why? Go ahead. So, you're saying you're, you're saying five and three, the season's done? Yes. I yeah. think I think the concern in Eric's... Define defense, done. Done yeah. in that you're not going to New Year's Six. Done that you're not going to win the conference title. Which You'll is need goal. help. I can't go that far. A lot of help. Because Tulane's about ready to hit their gauntlet. So there's right. that. You know, right. that, that's right. a thing too. UCF, uh, listen, how predictable UCF is able to blow up and, and get explosive. They're not predictable with that. You know, that's all we know. The, the, the other thing, to your point, Eric, will I will, where I will support you to be a little bit pessimistic is this team has not shown me yet under Gus Malzahn that it can win outside the state of Florida. The one win they have one in five. They're one is five another Temple of team right. that they blew out and knocked the doors off. Yes, one in five is the current stat. 11-1 and one at home. It was so lopsided, I had to ask for help yeah. where Elo came yes. in the dead of night being like, the, yeah, you counted it, it right? It was a Temple team that had more people on the sidelines than they had in the stands for crying out last year but anyway <laughs> no but, but look uh, I, I, those are on the field reasons and then there's off the field reasons look this was the year that cincinnati was supposed to be quote rebuilding this was supposed to be ucf's year you've got them at home you lose to cincinnati wait cincinnati. a minute let's go back to that preseason poll eric the ones that, the, the, the ones that you guys were telling me that, that cincinnati had no players left that the the, the poll was too that's what we highest. thought but that's just but that's not that's not the wisdom of the but crowd the, but here's the thing this is your best chance to beat them this year. You don't beat them this year. You're not going to beat them in December in Nippert. And you're not probably going to beat them next year, assuming they play at Cincinnati. And then Cincinnati, what if Cincinnati goes to a third New Year's Six Bowl game? That's going to sting for UCF fans. This is part of the rivalry I'm talking about here. Unless, 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 uh, unless Fickle gets yanked out of there somehow. I don't think so. I don't think he's bowl team. Uh, but here's the problem. Because UCF fans, we, Cincinnati, it's annoying. Because Cincinnati's got the media love affair that UCF doesn't have. 
Cincinnati did something that UCF could not do for whatever whatever reasons, excuses you want to make. They made the playoff. UCF did not. They got a lot of help that UCF didn't, though. Let's they got in, didn't they? Uh, yeah. They got in. Okay, whatever excuses you want to make, they got in. Well, we that, didn't. That's reasons, but details. The point is, this is your rival. Beat them at home. Beat them. Right. And you don't have to hear the noise. If you lose this game, you're going to hear about it. Like, why is Cincinnati so successful and why is UCF not? That's why this is a big game because you got to turn off that noise. Because it's but then where? But then what happens after that? Then you better start ready, figuring out how do you catch up in the big to, to them and how you get ready for the Big Twelve. Because if you're struggling against East Carolina, then we we got some issues we may have to discuss. Some the staff may have some questions about the roster they may have to address for the Big Twelve, which they probably are already. Kyle, in fairness, see, we've I addressed, see, I, we've see addressed the. The line, the offensive line and defensive line is going to have to upgrade this, when they get to this the This is 12. one of the things that drives me crazy. Is, yeah, we're going is, to the Big 12? Is, no, is fans who say, you know, oh, well, you know, we're clear. The loss to ECU, I actually had people saying to me on social media that the loss to ECU proves that we're not ready to go into the Big 12. I'm like, we're I not in the Big 12. Questions. We're in the American right now. But we're going to be in the Big 12 in less than a year. And yes, it, and we ha- and those <laughs> and there's a whole recruiting cycle and a whole transfer portal cycle coming up after that. Yeah, doesn't mean you're. But I think that this is the problem that, and I think there's concern. The belief is this team should be a top half Big Twelve team next year, right? Big Twelve. I don't know who's saying that. Every fan and media's expectations. Like when, that's that's the expectations with this program is you're every be- media. Every well, not you. Well, Kyle, you're a bubble. I have not seen. I have not seen a. I have not seen a single valid prediction. That's just hot takery. What's your I'm prediction sorry. then? I have no prediction. Well, here's the. I don't know what. The, I don't know what the Big Twelve looks like uh, going into what are you next talking year. About? We we're seeing it every week. We know the teams. Like we've addressed this. No, before. we don't. No, we no, don't we know the teams. We don't know who's going to be transferring where. Oh. We don't know wh- how the recruiting classes are breaking out. Next year is next year, man. No. Save wrong, it for next wrong. year. Cincinnati. Oh, next this. year is this year? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Thanks for game, violating the laws of physics lose, on this show. Congratulations. This, if you lose this game, you got to start thinking about next year. Kyle, Kyle, if we lose this game, I think we should just we we should we should return the invitation to the Big Twelve. No, is that, see, is that what we're saying? Ridiculous. Let's just, ridiculous. Yeah, let's just you know what? It, no, no, Brett no. Yormark visited earlier this week. We should just send him send him an email saying, Here's you know what, the, Brett? Thanks, but no the, thanks. The legitimate. Question. Sorry, we lost the ECU in Cincinnati. I, maybe we should reconsider. <laughs> Here's come on, game, Jersey. It was nice. Thank you for the invite. I think there will yeah. be leg- there are fair questions. Feel free to, to donate it. You know. I think the Put on eBay. media will have quest, fair questions. Where is this team going to stack up in the Big 12? We've addressed this with men's basketball. We've addressed this at nausea. We're, and we've done a good job of letting fans know that the Big 12 in basketball is going to be vicious. And that mm-hmm. it's going gonna, it's gonna to be an issue with men's basketball. It's gonna You're going to have to be Issue patient. with basketball, period. You had it Correct. right before. A uh, lot of reasons, which we'll that. get into more when we talk basketball. I don't think we've had this conversation about football. If this team has hiccups, we may have to have similar conversations about maybe there's more, maybe there's a lot more work to do as far as being competitive in the Big 12 in football than maybe some believe. Elo, I have to push back. Listen, some of us, and this group panel included, even with Drew here, have sure. been managing some expectations. No, you have. You're, one, in fairness, you're right. You and Drew have done a very good job. And fairness. one thing I will say, in Jeff's defense here, with the recruiting class concept, the one thing we have, granted, albeit short sample size, is that Gus Malzahn has recruited like no other UCF coach in history, period. Oh, no, no, I agree. I think long-term they're fine. Yeah. And that's the one thing I think that might actually be able to leap them competitive into the next uh, conference when you know when they're doing. I don't the- think that's the question. The question is next year. Well, actually, it is the question, sir, because what we haven't really seen yet is Gus's ability to recruit beef. It's not the same as recruiting for the Correct. State position. But There's we also a don't know if we have a quarterback more- either. You know, receivers who think they're sliced bread are a dime a dozen. Sure. Hey, listen, there've been. I agree with that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That agree with you there too. Yes. Running backs, um, their guys. There are a lot more running backs that Gus has connections to because of his time in the SEC. He's more talented at spotting that. You need a running back to even be considered an SEC school somewhere in there. But beef is a lot different. And credit credit to uh, Gus Malzahn for wanting to focus on Florida. 
but they're not necessarily known for their beef. I'm not saying that there aren't there aren't any linemen. No, that's fair. No, that's fair. Florida, that's but fair. in other parts of the well, country, South Georgia too. Like that's where you get a lot of guys too. I mean, and Gus has been pretty good at that place too. He has too. But we all know the focus has been here in Florida. There's there's not a whole lot. Uh, there's not a whole lot of GAs wow. in home state currently UC, in the UC, roster. UCF fans like to focus. But on, no, on Kai, Florida, I think all, those are all valid, and I think those are questions and topics that gets discussed. If you right. lose. To Cincinnati, and then you stumble against Memphis or Tulane. Those questions will be they'll be they'll be topics. It's concerns. Hey, baby, the talent in media is doing it, win or lose in this game. I'm just saying. That's true. Eric's out here underlining. You know, he's he's already. I'm sorry. I like teams L's to compete at a board. high level. I know this. It, it I don't is. have to. I don't have to worry about the women's teams. He's it worried is, about he's he's, he's worried about 2020 2026. You know, yeah, it's a little more important. Next year is actually a very important year. Sorry, Price, you know, it's the most important the year. American this American one, nah, next year. No, most. This is one thing where Josh Heupel was right. Yeah, Go one and zero. You know, Kurt Herbstreit. Actually, I found out I was wrong. One thing about turns out Fowler and Herbstreit were considering doing the UCF Cincinnati game. Herbstreit's in Tampa Bay doing the Bucks game. Oh yeah, covered. that's right. Short, short drive. We'd have been a short Instead, drive. Instead, he's going to actually, ironically enough, cover Josh Heupel with Kentucky and Tennessee. Have fun with that. That's the track. Uh, too, by the way, just there yeah. you go. go. Stoops family making things happen. All right, uh, Let's win, guys, please. Three thirty kick. Who's our crew instead, Eric? Uh, Mark Jones and RG three. Jonesy, Jonesy in the house. Does, jo- does Jonesy live in Miami still? No, he's doing. He's now the voice of the Sacramento Kings. Oh, that's right. He's out so west. He's out in West Coast now. Huh. Okay. Uh, RG three Heisman Trophy winner. RG three in the NFL house. Live RG three. Listen, I had a lot of fun talking about the now Red Tails. Sorry, Commanders whiffing for Griffin. Uh, so there you go. <laughs> well, we'll get to talk to with him more about that. I'm sure he'll have some fun stories to tell us in the press box <laughs> on Saturday. Three thirty kick on ESPN, right, Eric? Yeah, it would have been ABC had we beaten East Carolina, but no, we're on ESPN. You sure it would have been on ABC? Yes, I've been told we were. We would have been. Trust me, I've been ragged on since the dur- since during after the East Carolina game from up people up north that know about this stuff. I I I, I, not, I need I to never know hear the end of this. I, I need to know who this. your who your guy in Bristol is at some point. It's it's Felica, <laughs> isn't it? No, I wish. Oh God, I wish it was. If, he, if it was Felica, <laughs> I would have had him on the show by now. Trust me. Didn't we have him on the show once a few years ago? No, we tried. No, we tried. We tried. All right. Kind of a All right. Game. Well, anyway, three thirty. We kick. got Kyle though. We're fine. We All right. Him. When we get back, <laughs> <laughs> we get this, the bear. Uh, uh, when we get back, uh, we will talk about some things even bigger than Kyle, uh, including the Big Twelve, uh, and uh, uh, Brett Yormark paying a visit. We'll also talk to some ba- uh, talk some basketball. We had media day for both women's and men's, uh, and uh, Eric he probably gets. Some, Maybe we got some TV news to share a little bit. Well, maybe it's still in the speculative stage, which we'll touch on with the Big 12. We've got that more coming up when we return. It's the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast, and we are back after this. Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, just go to Cars.com. It's magical. We're back on the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Jeff, Eric, Kyle, and Bryson with you as we continue the, uh, well, football-adjacent discussion, I would say. Today was a pretty big day uh, on campus at UCF. Boy, did they roll out the black and gold carpet for Big 12 Commissioner Brett Yormark today. Like, when he arrived, they had a jersey ready for him. It, you mean Wednesday? Everyone would, or, or was or, or was? Oh, yeah, that's right. It was Wednesday. Yeah. Trust me, I had a lack of sleep to prove it. <laughs> I'll tell you, yeah, yeah I, I, me too, man. Holy Moses! Uh, so big. To, uh, so your mark finally made his uh, appearance here in Orlando, uh, and uh, Bryson and Kyle, you both were there. Um, you know, most of this, it's kind of 
I would say ceremonial, pretty much, right? You know, uh, but what did we glean from that visit in terms of uh, in, in terms of UCF, the move to the Big Twelve? Anything new on the conference front from that? And Kyle, I want to start with you. Well, yeah, no, it, it, the key things that I heard most of all, and, and, and there's there's another aspect that Bryson kind of found out himself about storytelling and trying to build a brand. I'll let him take care of that part. But what I will say is the things that, that got my attention was he's he, he, gleaning from what he said. There's a lot of, how you say, branding speak. The dude has said that he thinks of branding first right now for this group, as you should. Your blood is not blue in the same ways as the Big Ten in the SEC. As a matter of fact, I had asked him directly about about how competition affects his strategy and vision for the Big 12 moving you forward and how UCF went into it. And his response was, though it could be said to be dismissive, it was the right kind of dismissive, in my opinion, as I'm not thinking of them as competitors right now. I'm concentrating on the Big 12 being the best that it can be and trying to find what that looks like. Listen, if you don't know who or what you are yet, which one could definitely argue that compared, and I'm not saying there aren't big bloods and, and old institutions. Hell, Cincinnati itself goes back to 85, 1885. I get it. But the punchline's this. If you don't have the branding where people know you are a blue blood like that, you need to get that identity in place right now. The Big 12 has even before by the way, these American teams were snatched up by it, looked like the island of misfit toys. And now the Pac-12 is more misfit and the ACC, well, yeah. So with all that in mind, I don't want to insult your orange, Jeff. I'm just calling the ACC what it is. Oh, it's the okay. Year. They deserve it. Well, after that cleansing game, I, I, I would yep. give you a hug, but again, you'd tell me I'm hurting your back. But the punchline is this. The, the, <laughs> the Big 12 is in that unique position where there may not be, they may not be blue blood, and they can leverage it. They are the fun group. They have growth potential in a lot of places, and I'm really prepared for your mark to leverage that. What made me think that over and above our conversations here on the Black and Gold Banneret podcast? The use of the term fourth time zone rampant throughout that press conference in question. Uh, Bryce, I want to get your take on this too. But I, I, but Kyle, I want, I thought you made a, a, a good point there because one of, one of the things that, you know, I've had some discussions with some of the other SB Nation folk from that cover the remaining Big 12 schools. And they do view themselves as the underappreciated blue bloods of college football. Mm-hmm. And let's, I get it. Most of them have been around for more than a century. We, we're, we're the new guys here, okay? But in terms of what the brand of the new Big 12 can be, I maintain selfishly that those established schools have a lot to learn from us about how to brand yourself as, the, as a group that punches up. Let that has a chip you. that has a chip on your shoulder. Yeah, let me tell you how much I agree with you. There's that, and then matching your marks, uh, your uh, your marks branding conversation. As far as UCF can teach that conference, if I'm and I'm going to say something that I think you guys will respect and also be completely afraid of at the same time. If I'm your mark and I'm seeing what DeSalvo is doing with media at this at, at this institution, I'm bringing him to handle it conference wide. Hmm. Don't take the salver away from us. There it is. <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, no. My name's Brett no. Woodmark. That's man. what I do. He's mine do. now. Listen. <laughs> I mean, why right. just take him? I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna leave that one aside. Uh, but Bryson, I want to get your thoughts on on Woodmark. What stood out to you? I think what stood out to me. I mean, yes, they did mention the fourth time zone. The the echoes reverberate there. Of course, uh, but I do think that. He talked about be uh, Kyle talked about how they wanted to be young and hip, and I wanted to ask him about this, but unfortunately, I got uh, got I got sniped on that. But basically, what he sniped? Whoa! <laughs> well, I I wanted to ask the question, but someone else asked the question, and they know probably who they are. That uh that I that before I could, and so Kyle you know, it wasn't it wasn't you, Kyle? It wasn't Kyle. It wasn't Kyle. This but time. basically, <laughs> your mark. Your mark is already taking a lot of steps 
to get this conference rebranded in a way that can appeal to younger, that can appeal to younger people. I mean, in an article I read on CBS Sports, he's already has plans to sign with an ad agency and the, and the fact that they're just, he talked about how to story tell like crazy. And it makes a lot of sense because the Big Ten and the SEC, one of the big reasons that those two conferences get the big bucks that they have is because of their brand identities. And so if the Big 12 especially without Texas and Oklahoma, wants to get those big bucks, then they're going to have to storytell. Yormark also talked about how he, uh, they are currently kind of prepping for a Big 12 rebrand once the new schools come in. And I'm very interested to see what that in that see what that entails, whether there's a new signage or just what exactly it looks like I'm very intrigued, but we're going to have to wait and see, wait until July 2020 to 23 to find that out. But if anything, what, I, what I've learned is that he's very appreciative of the stuff that UCF brings to the table in that regard. I think that he's open to bringing events down here. There was a question asked about that. And while, and I think, and he said that beyond the current contracts that they have with certain cities, that certain cities and certain places, that they would be, he would, they would be very open to having events down here in Orlando. And I think that'll be a very big asset as well. So I think, I think Mark is looking to leverage all sorts of different stuff about UCF, whether it is the market, the social media approach that's taken to Kyle's point to its location. I, it, it's just very intriguing and very, I guess I, I'm anticipating to see what comes of it. Eric, you, say, you quote, oh, you, quote a, you quote a CBS uh, article, dude, he reiterated it there in your person too. Let's, let's be clear about that. Bryson's not just quoting an article. Your Mark reiterated during the press conference as well. Eric, Bryson makes the point about, you know, having, you know, about storytelling being important to the brand, but you got to have the story to tell. So what is the story? Because I feel like, you know, the, the national, now I don't, I don't think this, but the national perception of the big 12 heading into 2023 is going to be, you guys lost Texas and Oklahoma. And so now you're just, well, technically the, they the haven't rest, yet. Well, <laughs> well, but they're going to. Okay. But, but no, I mean, I think the funny thing is OU in Texas struggling this year is kind of benefiting the Big yes. 12. And That's true. You, I've and, been saying and, that to my family who are big SEC people all the time. Hey, listen, really, if, if he brings the best college football that money can buy, Bryson, you remember that. And a lot of experts would tell you outside of the SEC that this year the Big 12 might be the deepest league in football, which is why there are concerns about UCF, as we discussed in the last segment. But anyway, because uh, <laughs> there are no East Carolinas in the Big 12, folks. All right, all right, all right. But no, even think, Kansas is good. Yeah, they are. I mean, <laughs> when they have Jalen Daniels. Although I think Lance Lloyd Pole might be gone, so that might help. That might help. You can take, oh. Let's take the Nebraska job, Lance. Um, so um, you're going to get that rule. <laughs> Matt Rule. Yeah. That's true. Um, no, I think the laugh at Matt Rule, he beat us a couple times. Anyway, go the ahead. Thing of, the thing about the Big 12 is everybody's <laughs> focused on the football. Look, I think the football's been pretty – TCU's having a good year, uh, obviously, uh, Oklahoma State. I mean, it's still going to be a pretty good football league. But as a league as itself, I don't think people know the full story. I mean, re- well, this league, you can make the argument from an all-sports standpoint. The Big 12 is as good as the SEC and the ACC when it comes to all sports. I mean – and people want to ignore this, but I really do believe men's basketball plays a big role in this. Men's basketball is going to help them get their next TV deal. Why? Because ESPN doesn't want to lose Big 12 basketball because that brand is strong. And and I can tell you, and I, and, and I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, guys, you were there because uh, he Brett was asked about streaming and the importance what? of that. Yes. And he talked about how they want uh, you. Correct me if I'm wrong. He's, you know, he talked about how streaming is important. That's where it's going. But obviously, they want to be unlinear. One of the things I can tell you, the Big 12 draws in on streaming, on ESPN Plus and all the other sports. So there is value here that I think people don't realize of the passion that this league has for sports, not just football, but basketball and other sports. And I think that's part of the storytelling that I think will be told about this league that no, we weren't just a two team league. Right. No, a healthy amount of time spent on the big 12 now uh, platform and working with ESPN, ESPN plus to get that going. Yeah. Uh, Well, that, that, 
segues us to our next point that I wanted to talk about too. Uh, and Eric, you've been following this very closely. Um, you've listened to the Our Rand and March End podcast religiously. Um, we're starting to get some range of numbers. I think some things are starting to come into focus regarding the Big 12's potential TV deal. Uh, what's the latest update on that? So on Wednesday's edition of March in and our Ant podcast, they both reported, they both reported this, that they feel the Big 12 is close to a deal with ESPN and Fox. Uh, the num- you know, they heard that the Big 12 wants 400 million, but they're hearing it's going to be more likely 350 to 375. Uh, which you both can do the math on that real quick on what that average is out base for each school. Uh, but that's what they're reporting. They believe that they're going to, re- you know, basically sign a new renew, uh, renew basically with ESPN and Fox. Remember, Fox. twelve schools. So divide that by twelve. Three hundred sixty is going to be. If it's three sixty, yeah, it'll be thirty, 30 million. million. Thirty million. And well, the upper end would be that three seventy two. So there, you got the next one up there. Right? So I think that's what they're still sorting out. Uh, ESPN, according to them, would pay the majority of that, probably around two twenty five, which is ironic since many people believe ESPN allegedly tried to kill the Big Twelve a year or two ago. And it's also interesting because in the current contract, Fox actually pays more. Great point. So that could flip as far as could be important as far as priority. Who gets first picks the majority of weeks in a football season? Because when you're splitting with networks, they tend to alternate. But like for example, Fox gets the majority of first picks with the Big Ten. Uh, mm-hmm. They currently have them, uh, I believe them and the ESPN's 50-50 or 60-40 Fox as far as football picks. With this, it would suggest that ESPN will have the majority of the first picks for football. Uh, and then obviously, I also think they're going to have, they're going to pretty much coop up every basketball game imaginable. Big Monday stays, that Big 12, I mean, that's a, that's a huge deal. That's the under uh, deal there. Uh, so that's what they're reporting as far as the Big 12 is concerned, they think Fox, by the way, is going to go more towards ESPN and Amazon uh, deal. Now, they're skeptical about expansion because they don't believe that $30 million a year is going to drive a Pac-12 school to the Big 12. That's going to be interesting. Does that number entice a Pac-12 school to jump ship, especially for presidents who maybe say, I'd rather be on ESPN and Fox than be on Amazon the majority of the time? <laughs> You know, that's part of it. I don't think the presidents in the Pac-12 care, but I think the ADs do. Right. So, I mean, that's going to be interesting to play out because that could have impact expansion in the fourth time zone and what direction the Big 12 goes to. The other thing is, I believe this. I think that number will probably escalate if the Big 12 expands. Like, I could see a scenario, right? Couldn't you see the scenario if they added hypothetically uh, the Arizona schools, Colorado, Utah, or whatever combination you want to use – there's probably going to be clauses, I would guess, where that goes higher. Otherwise, I you know, I think some people within the league might be surprised that it's only quote unquote 350. Although I would say they probably were shooting, they were probably a little not realistic if they thought they were going to get a ton more. Well, uh, that's that's the next that's kind of the next question that I have is you know we, you know you guys Kyle and Bryson talked about you know again uh, the three mo- the, the three most famous words from that meeting with Brett Yarmark, fourth time zone. Obviously, he's not talking about the Atlantic time zone and adding Simon Fraser or something like that. But yeah, no, I, uh, I don't think you have to worry about Dino Babers coaching in the Big Twelve anytime soon. But <laughs> uh, obviously, you're looking Pacific, right? Sure. And the Pac-12 has uh, at, at least may, at least there are some grumblings that they're going to try and get at least two schools to try and replace uh, US, USC and UCLA for the time being. Um, in an effort to kind of right that ship. So, uh, Eric, I want to go back to you on this because I think you kind of have the best insight on this. Uh, who are the candidates? I, you know, and and more importantly, more importantly than who are the candidates is what is the trigger for that? What what is the thing that the Big Twelve would need to happen for you know expansion to get that that violent shove into serious? That's a good question, uh, because right now it depends what you want to believe. Do you believe that the Big Ten is happy and they're going to stay pat? You know, there's some reports that say that schools like Ohio State are against further expanding. But then there's other people like myself that's kind of skeptical on that and, and, and ask, do you do I really believe? Are you really just going to stay with two West Coast teams in the Big Ten? Like, I find that hard to believe, because if the Big Ten were to expand, that makes it easy for the Big 12. You just grab the at that point. That's easy. 
The complicated part is if the Big Ten doesn't expand, who's going to pull that trigger? I, I think that the, a lot of the Pac-12 schools don't want to be the school that says we killed the Pac-12. I, I don't think that they, they, oh, they don't, I don't think they care. I'm telling you. No, I'm telling you. They I'm do not. not sure they either, Eric. What? At this point, I'm not sure they do either. USC could already be blamed. You know what I'm saying? But right. I'm saying I. it depends on how this TV deal comes out. That's fair. Uh, is Oregon and Washington happy with? You mean you the know, Pac-12's TV deal? Yeah. What? Because right. what? I think what's going to happen here is the Big 12 is going to get a deal first. And then now the question is, how do the Pac-12 schools react to that? And then do they feel that this deal that they get, whatever they end up getting, is equal, close to what the Big 12, are they happy with it? Or do they feel like, no, we got to jump? You that's know, that's and I don't that's what it's going to trigger but we don't that could take a couple of years so I don't know exactly how everybody every school feels and, and I know Bryson has a point that that I'm going to let him get in with it real quick too but I think another thing that may be a factor in there too is if your mark's goal of national brand is achieved that's the other key word that he, key word phrase if you will that he's put along with fourth time zone yeah I know the two kind of go hand in hand but you can have a national brand without being asked out west just ask the SEC Bryson what was the point that you wanted to make well I think that we actually need to look at because we've mentioned Amazon right and I believe if I remember right there's reports that the Pac-12 wanted to lure Amazon for their media rights deal so one thing that I think we should look at is what is Thursday night football on Amazon doing? Because if the Pac-12 is going to sign a media rights deal with Amazon, then I think it wouldn't be too far-fetched that the Pac-12 coaches and ADs and, and, you know, the people, the decision makers, will look to Thursday night football and how well it does on Amazon to gauge whether, you know, Mm. playing ball on this is a good idea. And I, I, well, hold on, hold on. And the reason I say this is because Thursday night football is going down on Amazon started at 13 million in week two. It's gone down to 7.8 million in new viewers in week seven. So the, I, the idea is that, you know, like your mark said he wanted a broad appeal. And I think that that's sort of, and so if Amazon's viewership continues to go down and they end up getting an media deal, then I think that what would drive the Pac-12 teams over to the AC, to the Big 12 would be, we don't want to be on this media, this in this media rights deal that isn't going to get us a lot. We want to have broad appeal. Well, and they want to be on linear television. Like, they rather be, which is fair. I mean, I would rather be on linear television than streaming. I think that's what it is. It's not about the NFL. The NFL's that's a different animal. Uh, just trust me, Cal Stanford ain't drawing anywhere close to uh, even a Chicago Washington NFL game. So I think that's, mm-hmm. I think a more fair comparison would be how MLB's doing with their numbers with Apple and things like that. But I think the other factor of this, I'm really curious. Does Brett, does it have to be a Pac-12 school to get that Pacific time zone? Or does Brett consider going after San Diego State, who I think would be a target of the Pac-12 if they expand, for example? I think it would be a San Diego State, maybe Boise State, uh, among others. But San Diego State's the draw there. Would the Big 12 try to get San Diego State, if for nothing else, to block off the big the Pac-12 from growing and get that fourth time zone that he brought up in the presser, guys. I mean, that's sure. – I don't know the answer to that. I wonder if that's a plan B or is it basically I'm going to wait till the Pac-12 decides. I'd mm-hmm. say the one thing that I'm actually waiting – I'm sorry, Kyle, but I don't want to jump in here. Sure. I think that the big thing that we got to see is when that Pac-12 deal comes down with whoever it is, two things. Number one, is there an exit fee? Mm. And number two, most importantly – do those remaining schools agree to a grant of rights like the ACC did? But for And for how long? And for how long? Because if they want to lock it down, that's what they do. But I just don't know if those schools are going to agree to it. But not long term. We've already term. heard, I, I, heard you know, I mean, the rumblings about, you know, Oregon and Washington possibly, possibly you know, possibly jumping ship at the, at the instant that they get any, any indication of the Big Ten. I think that's a real thing. Um, you know, I think that the four corner schools, you know, they definitely are keeping an eye, on, keeping an eye on, on the big 12 from their own perspective. Kyle, go ahead. Yeah. Well, and, and to that, to your point there real quick, Jeff, at this point, yeah, obviously schools are going to be looking for that. And yeah, the country is seeing how the ACC is, ca- uh, 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 handcuffed 
to their situation. At this point, I don't see a scenario where your mark has the audacity, the cojones, if you will, to try to bring a, st- uh, a, a statement of rights in there like that. I, I just, there's no way in my mind he would want to. Well, not, not your mark, but I'm talking about the Pac-12. Excuse me. Yeah. Well, yeah. That, then I'll double down on my point if that's what we were talking about. I beg your pardon. Yeah. There's no way I feel like the Pac-12 would be in a position to think they have the leverage to do that. I don't know. Have you heard the guy? He's a little delusional. He's thinking that USC, UCLA are going to lose money and that the Pac-12 is going to catch up to the Big Ten in money. So uh, right. he, he, well, might he, be, he might he might be half right on that, actually. I don't, I, he's a little, a little I, out of control. You know, he's a little out of control. Delusion. I, I, speci- specifically with regard to USC, UCLA, they might be just along for the ride as far as we know. I think they'll be all right one way or the other. But – I think those are the big, uh, still open-ended questions, and we don't sure. know. And I think the first steps are the TV deals um, from that standpoint. And we'll see what happens. And, look, they're trying to figure out when they're going to have this college football playoff, which I do think plays a role in this. Does this playoff expanding kicks in in 24, 25, 26? I think there's a lot of connecting the dots still to be played out with all of this stuff. But I think the positive, if you're the Big 12, is it feels like their negotiations are going way better than Pac-12 is because from what again this is all marching at our end which I will take they, they have the most credibility I'm not taking you know swim you know Jeff Swain's of the world on Twitter that just throws stuff out there you know think you know that for fact they, they these guys know the higher-ups that you know they, they I believe every word they're saying kind of some hard feelings with Fox and the Pac-12 I don't know why gee wonder why there's some hard feelings but that's probably why their Fox is not in on the Pac-12 situation, which is why our Amazon, that's why they're trying to get Amazon, because one of the things that's kind of hurt both leagues is the NBC and CBS both went with the Big Ten. So not, you know, I think they were hoping one of them would jump, would not go to the Big Ten and still be an option to at least, at least jack up the prices. Well, I, I, I said before that I thought that the, that the real thing was, the way to kind of look at it was CBS wanted the Big Ten bad, especially after they lost the SEC. But the Big Ten wanted NBC because that gives them an in with Notre Dame. And so they decided, you know what, we'll just split, we'll just make this a, we'll make this a three-way deal, you know. They don't want Notre Dame to be the deciding factor, point blank. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they, but they're, but they're going to op- keep that door open for Notre Dame. Of course. So... That's why NBC got in on it. So I, I, I from a but UCF that's, perspective, that's just by the way, whatever the number ends up, you're winning either way. Don't, oh, like, yeah. don't <laughs> like, I don't care if it's 30, 31, whatever you're, you're, you're making out like bandits. it's still a, it's still a six, five to six X increase, isn't it? it from right now. So, I mean, that's a big deal. And again, you still get the exposure with ESPN and Fox. And by I the mean, way, that doesn't, that doesn't include, by the way, the bowl tie-ins, the CFP tie-ins, and the payoffs Much better from that. bowl games. Yeah, you're not going. You don't have to worry about going to uh, you know Boca bowls anymore. I think that I think that's that's the part that people get overlooked. They look at thirty million. They're like, oh well, that's less than. Well, wait a minute. You haven't factored in the bowls. You haven't factored. In, and here's the other thing. I think that's going to be a big factor too, Eric. You talk about how good basketball is. Ooh. The NCAA tournament credits that you get from having from having teams go. Correct. You get more money the further they go. In the, you get more money the more teams you get in and more money the further that those teams go. Exactly. And that's spread out over six years from the, the year that whatever happens. Like, you know, if, if UCF went to the Final Four, they you know, hypothetically, they would get a massive payout from that over the course of six years. And that adds up. We, that's why you talked about that, yeah. how important the Big 12. The Big 12 probably stands to make more money from the NCAA men's basketball tournament than any conference. Correct. Uh, maybe the ACC might argue with that, Big East, to some extent, but the point is taken. Uh, that's why this number, while it might come, oh, wow, I was expecting more. Trust me, on the back end, I call them incentives, however you want to call them. They're going to make even more money because you're right. The problem is in the American, for example, basketball's basically been a two bid league, maybe three. Normally they're gone by the second round. Big 12. They're riding that Houston train right now, man. I'll tell you that. Houston, Kansas, Baylor. I mean, you had the last two national champions. Uh, Cincinnati, let's not forget them. They're going to be hopefully decent. Uh, BYU's decent. I mean, everybody's good. Texas Tech was within a a call from winning a national title. So that's money raking in. 
Uh, we're not even discussing softball and the powerhouses that they've had with Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Texas uh, that get to the World Series there. So this is a and remember, ESPN is going to probably in negotiations to try to renew all of these NCAA championships. So you're right, leagues like the Big Twelve, the SEC, to their credit, even the ACC. I think the Big Ten has has failed in this part. All of these leagues have figured out you can make money outside of football. Yes, you're not going to make the max like you do in football, but you can make money with a strong basketball league, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where UCF's going to be. I mean, all these schools are going to make a ton of money. All right. Well, next next ball to drop. Right, we need to be good next year, Kyle. We got to be good next year. I want ne- UCF in the cheese head ball next year. Let's go. Ne- next, uh, the, the next thing, shoot to drop. We got to watch and see if this Big 12 deal wraps up. And then, Eric, you're saying – Watch the Pac-12 deal. What's what the, the reaction? What's the right? Right. How what's the it? number? Really? What's the domino effect? Correct. What's the number? And then Look what's the, the terms? Is the number a big gap? Who are the TV partners? That that's going to tell you the story. The tea leaves. All right. All right. Uh, Segway. We were talking about basketball a second ago, and uh, uh, we'll we'll have more b- uh, basketball to talk about next week's show as we begin our previews for both men's and women's season starting very soon. But uh, but first, I want to talk with you, uh, Kyle, about uh media day for both teams the men and the women uh and uh and bryson you were there too is that right you were there uh, as well for both basketball uh so it, let's start with the men this year i mean it's it really is was an unusual uh situation over there considering how few people you know we saw that were familiar faces but we did see some familiar faces and and my sense was that from looking at the coverage that you guys you know, uh, put up on our social media, Black and Gold Banneret uh, on Twitter as well as on Instagram, is that the two key on-floor faces that we're going to be talking about the most this year. On the men's side, it's going to be Darius Johnson. Mm-hmm. And on the women's side, it's going to be Destiny Thomas. Uh, at least that was my sense. Kyle, I want to start with you, and let's start with talking about the men's team. Obviously, and I don't, I don't want to make that feel like we're shortchanging C.J. Walker either, but he's going to be out for the first three games uh with a uh, with an injury so as UCF starts this season where they have a lot of new faces out there number one my question for you is it, 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 am I right in that assessment is this really Darius's time to shine and number two who are some of the new, who are some of the newer people that you now expect to kind of kind of take the reins a little bit well, uh, if you're asking me if I think DJ is going to be a big face, my response would be very simply, duh. Yeah, no, he's absolutely, he's, he's, he, he's, you, one could argue he started to be the face at times last year. Okay. What did it for me last year was two moments. One, you remember where he came out with, with she came he waved off and back at Jean. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, great. And both of them got a laugh out of him and I talked to him about it. And then on top of that, a bigger one, the video that came out where we saw CJ Walker about to, how you say, flip the proverbial table and DJ calmed him down. But here's the thing, Jeff. I feel like his presence after watching him on Zoom for AAC Media Day, as well as observing and talking to him personally at UCF Hoops Media Day, he's, he's grown even in that period of time. As, as a man getting comfortable in the leader's seat. So, yeah, definitely he is a, a leading and mentor figure. Mentor, I say, of course, to the Hendricks twins, who both cited him as a big thing of how they've helped found, find their comfort. And listen, Jeff, I've heard murmurings that the coaching staff at UCF feel about Taylor Hendricks that he'll be gone in two years. And I don't mean the portal. Uh, interesting. Um. I'm getting the sophomore year BJ Taylor vibe from Darius Johnson. That's that's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. Bryce, I'm going to ask you about the women's team. Uh, we saw Destiny Thomas there, obviously. Um, there was a little bit of like, kind of like, ah, we're not sure if she's going to come back, but she is back. Uh, what's your sense right now of where the women's team is as they adjust to Satya Messer taking over in her first year, uh, who for you is kind of the or kind of is kind of the captain at least as of right now, not the formally named captain, but you know who's who's the Darius Johnson equivalent, and who are some of the newer figures, newer faces that you think we're going to be seeing a little bit more of? Well, I would say that Destiny Thomas definitely deserves that, but she, I think that she is much more of a 
you know, w- watch me type of leader. I don't think she's as vocal as someone like Darius. Leader Johnson. by example, then, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. And it's good thing to have her to have her too, because uh, pretty everyone on this team but Destiny had like less than a hundred mi- at like a hundred minutes, if not less than that. I will say the fact that Nay Hutton was trot was put forth on, in front of the camera for American Media Day is a major indication. Talk. Kaya got the chance to speak with her. I myself spoke with Kiara Brown and Ashton Verholz. Verholz was also at AAC Media Day. And Kiara Brown talked about how this season she's coming back from injury and she started a couple of games the season before last. So yep. I would so I'd imagine a redemption out of her. You have Rachel Ranke, who's in her last season of 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 collegiate basketball. And she played in the Big 12. And I got to talk to her about how, you know about bringing that big 12 style of play over here, helping them get prepared and that's, and that sort of thing. So I think, and, and, and what's funny to me and I is I would watch for Sierra Godbolt. She's a true freshman. I don't know how much playing time she's going to get, but she has the distinction of being the only Florida native on this team. And she's from Orlando Lake Highland prep. So mm-hmm. I don't know how much time she's going to get, but she's the hometown hero of, the, of this team. And so if she does do something, then I think she's going to end up getting a lot of support behind her. I think this is, but I think the common thread throughout all these teams, through all, all these players, is that they have really bought in to what Coach Messer is, uh, Coach Messer's system, her, the, her mentality, her won't stop model. I have a feeling we're going to hear that a lot this year. I talked to Asia Todd about that. It, they really, it be, and that kind of speaks to, you know, there's not a lot of Florida people because there's all sorts of different people throughout all walks of, of American life on this team. And they have all bought, bought in to what coach Messer is, you know, putting forth. So while this is still very much a rebuild year, I think I'm very intrigued to see what this rebuild is going to be because it's clear that they don't, that, I guess you can say that it's they're not going to lay down in a sense. I think that this is this is they're going to try to hit the ground running and we'll see how they do that and how they do. Opening night for both teams is Monday, November the 7th. The women take on Winthrop uh, at 6 p.m., followed by the men officially scheduled at 8 against UNC Asheville. Probably might start a little bit later if the women's game goes long. Um, I love the double dips, by the way. I'm very much in favor of that. So that'll be our first look at a lot of new guys, Kyle, and a lot of new gals, too. Yeah, absolutely. Quick side note, though, too, uh, October 30th, this Sunday, they actually have a game, the women against St. Leo, as an exhibition. And a quick thing to add in with Bryson, um, there's another unfortunate uh, kind of vein between the two teams. You mentioned C.J. Walker will be out for time due to injury himself, uh, uh, himself there. Nay Hutton will also miss about another month or two. She too uh, came into the event with um, like a compression wrap thing around her. Like I forget what the the stabilizer, if you will. So, um, you know, I asked her about that. She said she's got about another month or two uh, before she'll be back a hundred percent as well. Quick thing that DJ said before I jump to you, Bryson, that anybody who's wondering about the starting five for the men, don't get too adjusted to a single idea. Uh, when I was talking to Darius Johnson, I asked him if it was going to be like last year where the uh, the opponent will dictate the starting five. And he says, well, you know, that is certainly something you can expect to see. Bryson? Uh, quick correction. I just uh, double, uh, double check. Kiara Brown is from Riviera Beach, Florida. So there's actually two Florida natives on the women's basketball team. But um, but I think with women's basketball, I actually think that they're that I feel like they can take a similar approach because last season there was pretty much like a starting five and then, you know, a sixth person and they got practically all the men's. I don't think we're going to see that this time, at least in my at least in my opinion. Yeah, Coach Presser said that, bro. And so that's go. And so I'm very intrigued to see how they're going to sp- to spread the ball of the, of the ball around here. And I think that I want to point forth that women's basketball, I think, is going to take a much similar approach. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, it's going to be wow. We've joked, you know, before that you know that the new uniform patch should have a "Hi, my name is" on the on on one shoulder for both squads, but. Uh, yeah, those big the 12 most, logos look good on the court. 
I was about that, to say that, that I was that I liked the Big Twelve with really cool. the practice courts. Yeah, uh, did you Chicks notice Chicks. also the well? I like the palm tree thing in the lane. Did you see that? Yeah, I'm not as big a fan. I was. I thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> I thought that was cool. Right. It's a little. It's a nice piece of style. Flair. To go with it. A little flair. Let, a little let's flair. keep it on the practice court. How about that? All right. Well, all right. bring back the black top. That's what I say. Let's yes. Say I liked that. Well, we're gonna do. We're gonna have to do a basketball special, Kyle. You've never been part of our basketball only special shows. It's a, it yeah, gets a little wild, bad. but we'll uh, we'll air some of those interviews. Obviously, all the interviews you guys have are on the YouTube channel, but uh, we'll have some opinions, some topics, hoops wise this year. Some if discussions. It's, if it's anything close to that lightsaber duel you and I had about UCF UConn in that tournament game, I'm oh, all. Oh yeah, <laughs> it will be. It'll be fun. It'll be fun. Uh, all right, so. I'll tease well, this. I think women's basketball success this season will come down to whether there is a conflict within the roster, which I'll explain in the basketball special. A conflict within the roster? Yeah, a little. I baby. know what he means. Yeah. yeah. Find right. out when we get our basketball special podcast, folks. Uh, stick around when we get back. we got a lot to talk about. Women's soccer tonight, Thursday, October 27th. Big win to talk about. Bryson Turner. Breaking down UCF, finishing off the regular season, winning the conference regular season title. They're going to host the American. we got that to talk about. Also, men's soccer uh, and volleyball continuing as well. All right, stick around. We get When we get back, we'll have that and more. This is the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. We're back here on the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Jeff Sharon, Eric Lopez, Kyle Nash is with us, as well as Bryson Turner. We're going to hit the grab bag a little bit, talk a little bit, uh, talk a little bit about the. See, I never like calling them the Olympic sports because it's kind of like it kind of like shoves them over to the side, especially when we talk about a team as successful as UCF women's soccer right now, guys. Eight, two, and four, six, zero, oh, and one in the conference. They have won six in a row including earlier tonight, we're recording this on Thursday, October 27th, uh, going into South Florida and Tampa and knocking off the Bulls two to nothing to finish off the regular season. This is after two straight one to nothing wins uh, over the week at, uh, over the last weekend, guys. And last Sunday, the 23rd, was the big win against Houston because they got the victory. And then they were all gathered around the uh, cell phone uh, to watch what uh, South Florida was doing in their game, at, with these two games that happened at the same exact time, and the final result came in: USF lost, and voila, UCF is the regular season American Athletic Conference champion, which means they get to hoist the trophy and they get to host the AAC championship uh, as well, starting Thursday, uh, a week from when we're recording this, November the third. Uh, we'll hop on the bracket here in a little bit, but uh, but Bryson, what a moment for UCF on uh, on Sunday, followed by this big win at Tampa, which actually helped them out in the RPI, didn't it? It very much did, Jeff. I'll say this: I was on the track watch watching them. I, I in my Twitter thread, I posted a video watching the team's reaction to USF getting the win. Which, by the way, since it, uh, Kristen Scott made a snide little remark that since he does not lose at home a feeling this team knows all too well from last yeah. year. Uh, so I think Kristen knew that this, this was very much in the cards, but her reaction what really stuck with me because as, because right when the clock hit zero on USF Cincy, they were all celebrating, but I noticed something and you can't really see it in my angle, but you can see it on the ESPN broadcast angle where I think the emotions just hit her like a, like a ton of bricks the second she, it really sunk in because she just kind of backed away, hands over hands over her mouth, like really sinking in. And then Katie Bradley immediately embraced her, followed by Caroline Delisle and Mathilde Kack, who those two players have been with Kristen since the beginning. I, I, I know we're early on and we're not halfway through yet, but that might be a moment of the year candidate right there. Mm-hmm. And, I think you might be right, yeah. But this team has been through so much after this. I was talking to Kristen like a, a little, a, a couple of days before the game. I was talking to Caroline uh, and I was talking to Caroline Lyle. Both of them really gave the indication that they really wanted a championship to kind of wrap out, round out their time here at UCF women's soccer. They were, they stayed in the dorm together. They've been talking about this since they were freshmen. Huge moment for them. Another huge moment, another Kristen Scott right now, 
33 goals on her career. She's now up tied for sixth for most all time in a career with Courtney Witten. We we have not seen a goal scorer like her. We have not seen a goal scorer like her in the Tiffany Roberts to Haydack era. But not let's not forget about Caroline Delisle. Look, the depth of this defensive line has has meant that she's not been under as much pressure as she's been last season. But Caroline Delisle had after to after getting six saves tonight against USF and tonight being Thursday, she is now in now fifth place all on her own for the most saves in U, in UCF uh, all time in UCF history. She just passed Jessica Coleman and Jennifer Maris, and she is now chasing Vera Varis for fourth. Uh, she's only given up two goals in conference play. They were both against Tulsa back on the yeah. 16th. I all, oh, I also want to mention you, Jeff. Um, this is a, they're on a seven match winning streak. USF is the seven. That's right, seven in a row. So, uh, and so that means that they're also. Chris and Scott came back too. Not nine, nine, two, and four. So uh, that means that the tournament is set uh, for the American Eric. And let's let's take a look at how this breaks down because remember, first round is set for this Sunday, and they're at they're at the home sites. Right. Uh, and, and where the top two teams get the buy, so the top six get in, top two teams get the buy. That's UCF and South Florida. So game one is SMU at Cincinnati. Game two is ECU at Memphis on Sunday, and then the winners of those matches go. Well, game one is SMU Cincinnati, so that they're going to play. The winner of that game goes to, uh, comes here to UCF to play South Florida at 4 p.m. Thursday, November third followed by UCF in the nightcap at 7 p.m. that night. Again, th- Thursday, November the 3rd, facing either East Carolina or Memphis. How did this bracket shake out for uh, UCF? Could see another UCF-Memphis battle for the ages and what could and- be their final time. The nemesis of, I mean, this is the rivalry in soccer yeah. that Memphis-UCF goes way back in years. And I should, and, and forgive me, I should mention Memphis beat ECU earlier this year in Memphis for nothing in their only match. Yeah, I expect Memphis. Season, I so. expect Memphis to win that game. It's going to set up Memphis UCF. That's going to be a battle. Remember, they had a draw, but this is they've had a long history. And Score, Memphis, scoreless Memphis, draw. Kristen Scott wasn't wasn't didn't play that game. Didn't I play, think, is that right? uh, Didn't play in that match. Uh, but Memphis knows they need to win the conference tournament. UCF. I think for UCF, if they get to the final, and let's say you know, I think they'll be all right from it at large. I actually think they got a shot. If they win the conference tournament, I think they're going to host a first round match. Remember, in women's soccer, the top they're going to seed the top thirty two. Them in volleyball this year are going to seed the top thirty two. In women's soccer, the top thirty two host the first round matches, and then the top sixteen teams host the second round in the Sweet Sixteen potentially. So UCF has a chance to host a first round match. I think if they win the conference title, I think they're almost a lock to host a conference uh, host a first round. If they lose. That could get tricky. They may have to go on the road. I think they're in with this win over South Florida. I just find it hard to believe you're going to knock them out if they lose. And keep this in mind in soccer, if because this just gets confusing in conference pl- tournament play. If you if the match ends in a draw, you know that gets decided on penalty kicks. Officially, that's a draw. So even though you right. might lose in penalty kicks, so that could be important because like let's say UCF loses in penalty kicks. Officially, that's a draw not a loss so just keep that in mind because they could come down to that but uh usf obviously got the two seed that's the other big story there uh but look what an opportunity for this group to finish at home try to win a conference tournament title which they haven't done ironically since the first year of the american in 2013 that was tiff mm-hmm. first first year trying to kind of back end it with a conference tournament title but what a run this group has been Kristen scott's been amazing I think I expect UCF to have the player of the year in the league in Scott, perhaps goalkeeper of the year in Delio and the coaching staff of the year with Zahedak. I expect those awards to come out prior to those games. But uh, look, single elimination tournament at home, maybe the last UCF team to ever host a conference tournament because the Big 12 That's tends true. to go neutral sites. So yeah. could be the last time. This could be it. Uh, Katie Bradley and Diana Martin actually uh, scored the two goals for UCF against South Florida today, uh, which boosted their RPI. Uh, well, actually, according to this, this is through October 23rd. They haven't updated the RPI just yet, Eric. But uh, right now we're looking at UCF at 26. Right. 
Uh, but is this going to help them? I think South Florida. Well, the be- soccer, w- your win percentage in soccer helps go up. Like even you know, you know they, that's the thing that's helped them. As long as you keep winning, don't lose your RP. Your percentage win percentage increases there. Um, but man, South Florida's RPI is one thirty two. By the way, Yikes. yeah, they've had a down year by their standards. But hey, that's their problem. Um, <laughs> but look, I think for the American, I think UCF. As long as they get, if they can get to the final, I'm worried about the Memphis match. That one, if they play Memphis, I rather play East Carolina, honestly. So go Pirates, because um, Memphis scares me a little bit there. But if they get to the final, I think they're going to be in the tournament. Everybody else has to win the conference tournament to get in. Either it's going to be a one bid yeah. league or a two bid league. Maybe UCF gets in as an at large. But Kristen Scott, nine goals this year, going to be player of the year, has scored. Think about this. UCF's offense this year was down. They're averaging about one six a game. Last year, they were at two goals. She's picked up. She's carried this offense with good defense, a much improved defense that has helped the, uh, the shots against defensively are down 40%, which is good from a defensive standpoint. Um, they're a really good team. They're deep. They're talented. They're peaking. Uh so hopefully, yeah. fingers crossed, they take care of business next week, and then they'll, they'll uh, find out what, what their destination is as far as the NCAA tournament. Hopefully host a first-round game, and then they're probably going to get uh, have to go to Tallahassee and probably paired with FSU. All right. And we'll, keeping, we'll be in keeping with that. We'll have uh, most likely coverage of where they're going to be going uh, when uh, the selection uh, – or, or, or not the selection, but we'll be previewing the American Athletic Conference Championship. Selection show, by Selection show is going to be the weekend after that. Monday, November 7th, the same day as the men's and women's basketball doubleheader. We're going to have a football Busy media day. availability, a soccer, perhaps a soccer watch party, and a basketball opening day doubleheader. Boys, <laughs> it's going to be a long day. Buckle all, up. All, all man, a- Kyle, get ready. We're, we're, we're all going to be we're all gonna be somewhere. Welcome to November. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that flips us over to the men's side, who uh, right now, update on them. Six and five, three and four in the conference, but got a two-to-one win, a huge two-to-one win last Friday at home against number 13, Charlotte. This is, And we were all talking about this after. It's like, this American Athletic Conference this year, man, is it, it, just absolutely wild because, you know, and we thought it would be weird, but... It, it, we had no idea maybe quite as weird. Now, UCF right now is sixth, which means they are hanging on to the last conference tournament spot. Believe it or not, Charlotte's in seventh, and they're ranked number 13. They could be ranked in the top 25 and miss the conference tournament, uh, which would be astounding in its own right. But the, but UCF has two games left. They play Friday night at Tulsa. Uh, certainly their bugaboo the last couple years. Uh, tells us ranked number 14 in the country right now before they come home Wednesday against South Florida to finish out the season, uh, to finish out the regular season. And those are two huge games right now. And, uh, and Eric, I want to get to you. This is the, the situation out there. Do they, do you think that they have to win out at least at this point right now? Just to secure a conference tournament spot. Let's get start with that, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that's what I mean, yeah. Because, I mean, you're going to Tulsa. That's going to be a challenge. And then South Florida just knocked off Charlotte in a dramatic fashion in the final seconds. Two seconds left. They got a goal to win that game. Unbelievable. Right. Uh, and they've been FIU. So there's their not gimmies here. And, uh, oh, man, this is a mess. It's just a mess, this league. and it's Isn't it's, it a blast in kind of a way? I mean, obviously no, not, it is. That I mean, UC, it, not that you see – not where UCF is, well, but, like – this is this is wild, man. This this it this is, story is. is the this this conference is the wild west. Well, this year. credit credit Mike Oresco, give him credit. They allowed the CUSA schools to basically come in quicker because CUSA fell. Yeah, apart. a year early. Um, and they've built this strong league, and they're going to be a strong league moving forward. Even if they even with the losses of UCF, they're the third strongest league in the sport. The thing that just just bothers me, man. Lost to FAU. And then at UAB, two teams over 100 RPI. If they win those oh, yeah. matches, if they win those matches, Jeff, we're not having this conversation. I know. They're not, they'd probably know. be easily in the conference tournament. They might be in the mix for the regular season title. And they would probably be ranked. And we would have three fall sports teams ranked in the top 25 all at the same time. It, 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 they, they, they beat FIU in Miami, beat Charlotte. Yeah. And then lost it, you know, I, on either I end of that. Lost right. to UAB. And FAU, it's just, it's, it's mind-boggling. But I, 
that's how crazy this league is. Right now, SMU leads at five and two. Tulsa's right behind him at four, two, and one. And I tell you, you look at the RPI. Uh, right now, SMU sixth in the country. They're a threat. They are that let's say let's call it like we see it. They are a legit threat to win the national championship. No yep. doubt about it. Yep. Uh, interestingly enough, Kentucky, who's in the Sun Belt where UCF is going, is number one in the RPI. Right. Uh, from there, Tulsa's 11th in the RPI. Uh, that's another national title contender. Remember, they were an Elite Eight team a year ago. Yeah. That's, that's, FIU, that's 30, FIU 32, Memphis 35, Charlotte 38. Oof. Yeah. That's so why th- that's why UCF's probably going to first get to the conference tournament and then probably yeah. probably have to win it at, at least get to the final to get in the conference. It's it's going to be interesting how many teams the league gets. The most they've ever yeah. had is three. They have a shot to break that. We'll see. UCF is at sixty five right now. And remember, the tournament's only forty eight teams. I uh-huh. have yeah. That's that's the that's the thing the you have to remember. So look, in our respect- this conference is. I went, if you just need to get into the conference tournament and you have a shot to win it. I, I, yeah, that's that's what I think. If you're UCF right now, you got to think you're exactly right, Bryce. And you just got to think to yourself, look, let's just get into the let's get into the tournament and then let the chips fall where they may. Because as we have seen from UCF and from and yeah, again, look at what happened with Charlotte. Anybody can be anybody in this league right now. You, you, actually, you want to keep look at that because UCF tomorrow. I actually I, I did the math. And All right. So UCF, what's the situation? UCF can actually clinch a playoff spot tomorrow night, and this is who UCF fans need to root for. First, we need the win against Tulsa. That much is obvious. Mm-hmm. The other factor is what is Charlotte and FAU doing? Because if UCF wins and Charlotte and FAU lose then that means it doesn't matter what happens in the final game. UCF will be ahead of them by four points, which means they clinch the sixth seed. So at least if they draw, though, that's the question. If uh, if UCF draws it, it, then the the final game is going to matter because they have to be exceed three points. So they have to win and Charlotte and FAU have to lose. And who are Charlotte and FAU playing? Charlotte is playing FIU and FAU is playing SMU. So now, now let me ask you this: What if the, so you said that you, if they lose, you lose, you get zero points. If you win, you get three. Uh, if you draw, you get one. Yeah. So if UCF wins, they get they get plus three. FAU draws, they get plus one, which means theoretically they could, I guess, tie UCF. Does that mean that FAU would get the jump on them because of the head to head? As long as they finish tied. Basically, okay. basically, uh, we don't have to worry about Charlotte times. We have the tiebreaker over Charlotte. So if Charlotte draws, that's okay. We have the tiebreaker if Charlotte and UCF both get the same result in the final week. The big thing is going to be if FAU gets the draw against SMU, which I mean, okay, SMU is number one in the conference. But then again, who knows with this conference? So if FAU draw, if FAU draws, and then both FAU and UCF win their final matches, then FAU will get another head-to-head, and then that's really going to make that loss sting. Man, so, this, just, this, this conference is just crazy. Look, crazy. just root for FIU to beat Charlotte, root for SMU to beat FAU, and then we get the win against Tulsa, and we're good. Basically, if you're a UCF fan, just keep an eye on all of, on all of these matches. Uh, UC, FIU Charlotte and F- UCF Tulsa starts at 7 p.m. on fr- on Friday, October 28th, and then SMU and FAU kick off an hour later at 8. So, it's like what Al Davis ESPN says. Plus, if you have ESPN just, Plus, boot up the multicast. It's just like what Al Davis says. Just win, baby. Just win, baby. That's what you got to get done. That's that's going to be tough against Tulsa. Oh, that's a also, good team out there. But it's not – It's it's it, it is doable. Oh yeah, it's it's very doable, especially with the with the offense this team has. Gino, um, recently Gino Vivi has managed to tie for fifth place for the most career assists in in program history with Roni Francois. No one has gotten as many assists as Gino Vivi has had over the course of his career since the turn of the century. That's wow. how long it's been. And then, uh, and then also Gino Vivi t- got the, to sixty one career points to tie Ramey Vemas for the top 10 all-time points in a career there. 
And then Luca, De- and then right now Luca Dorado has 28 goals, and that puts and that puts him now in a tie for eight on the top 10 all-time goal scoring lists. Importantly, Luca Dorado is also tied for fifth in the country with 11 goals. The the country's leaders right now three-way tie for most goals in the country. Finn Ballard McBride of UC Santa Barbara, Elliot Goldthorpe, what a name from Hofstra, and MD Myers of Rutgers have 13. Uh, Dorado is in a six-way tie for fifth uh, in in uh, total goals this year. So he's right in the mix for potentially uh, uh, the uh, national lead in goals. We'll see how it goes against, uh, against Tulsa on Friday night at 7. That match will be on ESPN Plus, number 14, Tulsa, uh, from Oklahoma. And then they're back home Wednesday, 7 p.m., South Florida, uh, at the UCF Track and Soccer Complex. Another six points on the war on I-4 at stake, and it's senior day for that team. All right, over to volleyball. 17-1, and 9-1 and in the conference. They've won five in a row. They are 8-0 and at home and uh, handled another uh, sweep of uh, Cincinnati in Cincinnati uh, on Friday. This was a, sort of a weird week for them because they beat South Florida. They swept Cincinnati. They swept South Florida at home. Swept Cincinnati on the road. Now they're back home uh, after a week off, or excuse me, they're on the road again on Friday. They're actually flying out now to face it. This is the long road trip. This is Tulsa, Wichita State, uh, where, by the way, they have already played. Remember, because of the hurricane, uh, they ended up playing Tulsa in Wichita back on September 30th, swept them. Played at Wichita State the following Sunday, swept them. So here's a return trip. They actually play at Tulsa this time around and then and then play Wichita at Wichita on Sunday. So uh, this team has a chance once again to, well, they haven't lost it. They have not lost a set, Bryson Turner, since the Houston match back on Friday, October the 7th, 20 days ago, uh, in all those matches. So um, I think this little fire underneath them, to say the least, uh, and... You know, here they are with, with another chance at uh, at a couple more road wins. And, uh, you know, Todd Dagenet manipulated the schedule quite nicely, I think, in getting these two ki- these two games on, the, these two matches on the road, no? I, I think he did. I, I think especially helps that they played in Wichita State before. So I think that will definitely help since they're a little more familiar with that, with that site than they would with other opponents. But one thing that Dagenet said after the South Florida game that really stood out to me is that he mentions that by October, usually teams kind of opponents kind of know what you're about and start to really hone in on what makes your team good and force you to beat them in other ways. And I say that to say because McKenna Melville had some of the lowest hitting percentage, percentages of the entire season this week, hitting 130 against USF and 150 against Cincinnati and those and both the Claudia Dillon and Heidi Bondi were the two leaders and kills in in both respective matches and so what I think stood out for me this week this week Jeff is that team is that opponents seem to be honing on taking McKenna Melville out of the game and forcing the Knights to beat them in in other ways and so far they've done that because they because once again this team's talented Claudia Dillon stepped up well Heidi Bondi stepped up well but I wouldn't be shocked if they're if through running through these final these final couple weeks that their teams are really going to target McKenna Melville Houston did and Houston did too and they got the win off of that so I have to imagine they probably saw the film there well I'm looking at uh McKenna's totals right now she's got 326 kills on the season which is 33rd in the country earlier she was first uh, which you know I I think that you know you know we'd be silly if we didn't think that uh, teams would eventually figure that out. Well, in fairness uh, to her, I mean, when you're doing straight sets, you're not going to g- gobble up a lot of kills. She's 30 fair. kills per set. So I think that's a more accurate because, you know, hey, you're playing three sets. You're not going to jack up a lot of kill numbers. But I think also, you know, we've seen the emergence of Claudia. I thought Claudia had her best weekend as a knight this past weekend. Uh, she won uh, She won a conference award uh, as well. And you know, here we are nitpicking for a team that's seventeen and one right now, and is uh, and is third in the country, third in the country in team hit, hitting percentage, fifth in kills per set, sixth in assists per set. 
uh, and is holding their opponents to just 160, which is 16th best in the country. Um, back in the top 25, too. Yeah, and they're, and they're back in the top 25, along with Houston, which, interestingly enough, means it's the first time ever, yep. Eric. Is that right? That we first have two time American in the history, teams in the top yeah. 25? First time in the history of the American Athletic Conference. They'll have two teams ranked in the top 25, long overdue. I don't know why it didn't happen during the Jordan Thompson years with Cincinnati and UCF, but uh, better late than never. So, well-deserved. Both of those teams deserve to be in the top 25. And if you look at both teams' schedules moving forward, both have to go to Wichita State, both host SMU. You can make the argument those are the two games that could be trick- tricky for both UCF Houston. Otherwise, they'll be heavy favorites in the rest of the matches. By the time we get to Black Friday, we could have a massive collision between UCF and Houston with yeah. uh, the conference championship on the line, among uh, many things. But this is a tricky weekend with Wichita. Wichita pushed Houston to a five-setter last week in Houston. It was up. I'm curious to see what you know, Wichita has fire, firepower when they're clicking. We'll see what how UCF responds playing on the Sunday against Wichita mm. after playing at Tulsa. The first time around, remember, they played Tulsa and Wichita, but both were at Wichita. Yeah. Uh, quick shout-out, by the way. Amber Olson, fourth in the country in assists per set. I think this is the highest she's ever been in the yeah, national Yeah, I think rankings. she, you know, we've point, talked so much. 11 and a half. We've talked so much about McKenna and the All-American and, and the, you know, I think Olsen should get some consideration for All-American honorable mention, uh, which Jenny Frank accomplished in 03. So that yeah. could, uh, could be the second center to do that. Olsen uh, also got her 1,000th career dig against USF, 14th player ever to do that. You right. See. And, uh, and we're, we'd be remiss if we didn't do Mac Watch here. Uh, she is right now at 2,316 kills. Uh, which is, what is that, 184 from the Vaunt to 2,500 mark. And where is she in the uh, – uh, I was trying to figure – what was the number to get her into the top 10? It, was, it, it wasn't quite 2,500. It was 24-something, I forget. Right? But, she's, but she's coming close to that mark. It's going to be pretty close. I think she, she might get it uh, as UCF approaches the postseason. Um, but, uh, you know, it's going to be it, – it, Again, Eric, I think you make a good point. Like, you know, how many more matches do we have? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten matches to go in the regular season. There's no conference tournament plus the NCAAs. So. Yeah. Depends how many sets you play. I mean, you know, it's going to be interesting. Uh, UCF, by the way, 19 in the RPI. Still outside the top 16. It's going to be tough to move up to that top 16. So. We'll see yeah. what happens there, even with them. But they're 19. Obviously, them and women's soccer in great position to make the tournament. Men's soccer has work to do, as we've discussed. But uh, 19, that's where they're at right now. It's looking like a two-bid league for the American in women's volleyball, the way it's headed with UCF and uh, Houston. Yeah. All right. So the travel, uh, the uh, situation continues. We wrap up with men's golf, who uh, was uh, local uh, this past weekend as they finish up their fall season in, in what we call the the Masters of College Golf, which is the Isleworth Collegiate, uh, right near Tiger Woods' old stopping grounds. Uh, and uh, Bryson, UCF, uh, it, you know, at least with a pretty decent showing uh, as a team uh, and, uh, and also individually as well in, on the uh, Isleworth course. Yes, sir. Louis Carrera. I, I have to say, Louis Carrera has had a very good second half of 2022. He had that amateur title win preseason. He won the Hartford Hawks Invitational. And now he's been, he, he leads the team at the Iowa Collegiate, finishing at three under par for the tournament in a tie for 11th. He finished seven strokes behind the the, the two leading, indivi- leading individuals. As a team, UCF finished Right around the middle of the pack, they finished uh, 16 over par in ninth place at behind and uh, behind Auburn. Auburn took the win at 27 under par. The top seven, by the way, were all represented by like top 50 golf stat ranking teams. And what I think this kind of shows us is I think UCF men's golf is kind of hovering at around the same place they were last season. And uh, during last season, I mentioned how they were able to barely squeak themselves into a regional. So I think it, they're on that same borderline territory right now. Giant Jabale kind of had an off had an off 
performance this week at at Iowa. He finished in a tie for 37th at seven over. I think that if he can get a rebound, he can rebound and Louis Carrera can continue doing what he's doing, just like how last season Javal had paired up with Teddy T-Tack and they managed to make it to the regional. I think they'll be able to barely squeak into the regional again, but we'll see how that goes. They, they'll be, they will be going off for the holiday break and they will be back in early February. All right. And that means we are done for the day uh, as well as we got. By the way, if you're listening, we thank you for getting through this point. Sorry, we're a little bit late, but we had a lot of stuff going on. We wanted to get you as fully prepared for this as humanly possible. And here we go. Saturday, UCF 330 against Cincinnati. Uh, We will be there. We'll have night shift after the game. Kyle, you're going to be there as well. That's right. Uh. And Bryce, you also want a little mention uh, cross country is going to be in the American Athletic Conference meet this weekend too. Yes, to, uh, if you are listening, if you are listening to this, it's actually happening Friday. So gotcha. if you if you're listening to this and it's on, tune in. UCF yeah. Knights, and I think they're putting that on ESPN Plus too, aren't they? Yes, yes, on okay. ESPN. All right. Hey, big I think day it might Saturday. Be a- big big day Saturday with football game homecoming. Yep. I mean, Kyle's going to be there. That's big enough. Cincinnati. Right? But but big but even bigger. Obviously, a couple notes. Softball will be uh, recognized during the game for winning That's the right. conference championship. Yours truly may or may not uh, may may make a cameo there. But Ooh. even even more so, ladies and gentlemen. Props to our friend Trace Troco for this little detail. Among people that will be honored at the football game, arguably the goat himself, Numero Ocho, number eight, back baby, Dante. Dante's back. He will be at the Cincinnati. Ooh. He has told Trace Troco that in an interview they did. So he will be honored. So Jeffrey, you'll probably get to call Dante Culpepper's oh, name. Huh? Huh? That's, oh, the, the, that's the tentative plan as of, uh, you know, tentative plan. We'll just get good conservative. So that could be a pretty special moment. So hopefully it'll be a fun environment and uh, should be a fun day. Uh, it's always yep. this for homecoming. Big game there. So, Yep. Don't forget uh, Friday as well. Volleyball is at Tulsa. Men's soccer is also at Tulsa. A little and we got fall ball, softball, yep. baseball. It can't get here fast enough. I know yep. Brian Murphy's counting down the days, and I'm counting down the days. And, uh, of course, you know, football at, uh, at 3.30 <laughs> on Saturday against ESPN. Number 20, Cincinnati. Hey, now like we said, get a dub there, and the script gets flipped just like that. Win it for so. Dante. Win it for, win it for Dante. That's what we got to do. All right, so – once again, thank you to all of you who are listening. You can follow us uh, on Twitter, UCF Banner underscore SPN. You can follow, uh, uh, SBN, I should say. Uh, you can also follow us each individually. I'm at Jeff underscore Sharon. Eric is at Eric Lopez Elo. Kyle is at the SOTG for the student of the game. And Bryson is at It's Bryson Turner. Don't forget to follow uh, Andrew Glukov, Stat Boy Drew. You can also follow Derek Warden, underscore DS Warden. Uh, and also uh, Noah Goldberg at the Noah Goldberg. Noah has just been going nuts on the photos, man. He, he's, well, he's, he's, he's so excited. Himself, yeah, he's trying to keep himself distracted. He's devastated. He was looking forward to going to his first game day. I mean, the guy, I mean, I, I felt I know, bad for him. I know, but he's, he's rebounded nicely, and we're really proud of him on that. Hop on over to our YouTube channel. We got the basketball media, uh, media uh, day playlists up there as well. Uh, you can also follow us on Instagram, uh, Black and Gold Banneret. And also uh, on Facebook, facebook.com slash black and gold banner uh, as well. If you subscribe to our podcast already, we thank you. Leave us a rating if you don't. What are you waiting for? Subscribe to our podcast right now uh, where uh, we are available on either Android or Apple, whatever you prefer. We will see you for night shift after the Cincinnati game. For all of us here at Black and Gold Banner, I'm Jeff Sharon saying thank you so much for listening. Go nice, charge on. We will see you. Saturday night.